Okay, everyone is talking about corruption in this nation, South Africa. And my question is, why is there so much corruption? Why are people stealing from their organizations without realizing that they're stealing from their children and their children's children? And I believe that once you understand how behavior was learned, it becomes easier to unlearn it. So why corruption? I find it interesting because earlier on today, I was speaking at a women's academy and I see such potential in these women. They can run the country literally. And yet, on the other hand, we read so much negative stuff about what's going on in this nation, particularly to do with corruption, whether it's in government or organizations or schools. So I think it's something we need to address and something we need to explore. So I had an interesting conversation a few months ago with a guy who surprisingly to me said, oh, I used to be a gangster. OK, this guy is running a particular shop and doing various entrepreneurial things. But he said to me, Paul, I used to be a gangster. And so, of course, the way my researcher mind works, I began to ask him questions about these these things that he used to do. And I said to him, what caused you to be a gangster in the first place? How did you get to that place of becoming a gangster? And he said, you know what, Paul? We grew up seeing our uncles who are now living in fancy houses in Santon with legitimate jobs, but we grew up seeing them being gangsters, okay? And that tells me one thing. It tells me that the gangsterism was modeled. They saw people doing it. And I believe that's one of the causes of corruption today. People are seeing leaders doing it and they feel like, well, if they can do it and get away with it, then why can't I do it? And this guy went on to say, you know, we saw the fancy cars, you know, that uh, these uncles of ours were driving poor. And the thing is, we also wanted this lifestyle and we wanted it now. So I said to him, okay, so impatience was there. He said to me, yes. Okay. They didn't understand delayed gratification. And I believe that's something that's taught when children are still young. Can we delay our gratification? Can I have something maybe tomorrow, right? And wait for it instead of embracing it today and having maybe less. So delayed gratification. And we called it impatience then because it is that. And then he said to me, Paul, the other thing is it's not easy going to work. No one wants to get up in the morning and actually go to work every day. It's difficult. And I said, so laziness must have been one of these things. And he said, yes, Paul, laziness. And it's interesting that he said that because just recently I was speaking to someone um, who is going to be going into farming. And this person potentially can end up running nine farms that she's inherited. And she said something interesting thing to me. She said, you know what? I, I want to get a hold of my cousins to assist me and work on the farm. And I said, just be careful of that. I said to her, you know, people from Zimbabwe, people from Malawi come from a very strong agrarian background. But here in South Africa, a lot of you aren't necessarily like that. And she said, Paul, just say it. We're lazy. And I didn't want to say that. All right. But... In a large portion of this country, there is a lot of laziness. The work ethic isn't great. And I find it interesting how people will often say, Paul, how can you say that about us? We're not lazy. And then I say, well, why are you always bringing your kids to me and saying, please, can you help out my kids? Because they never want to work. They never want to do anything. Right. So I find it interesting that this this former gangster acknowledged laziness as one of the reasons for gangsterism. I then said to him, so what would happen? Like, how did it actually take place? He says, Paul, just remember when we were involved in this kind of thing, there always had to be someone on the inside who helped us. He spoke about certain heists and he said that for you to actually know where to actually get a uh, hold of that particular vehicle, nab uh, all the money and so on, whatever it is, 100 million rand. He said to me something interesting. He says, you have to have someone on the inside who actually helps you in that process, who tells you all the information, for example, uh, where the vehicle will be at what time. And that person gets a cut of the money that you steal. And so that tells me that corruption, for it to really work, it has to be systemic. And that's really what we're seeing. It's a system of corruption. So whenever you have someone going down for fraud, I can guarantee you that there'll be a whole lot of other people. So he shared these things with me. But what, he, what was very telling in the conversation was the solution. Because I said, well, why did you stop? What made you change? And he said a couple of things. He said to me, Paul, I gave my life to Christ. Okay. So uh, there was some form of conversion there. 
And I find that interesting because it means that there was now an accountability to someone or something higher than himself. He wasn't a law unto himself. And that's the essence of integrity. Who am I when no one is watching? I'm not going to do this particular thing, not just because I, I don't want to get caught, but simply because I have a conscience and I'm accountable to God ultimately. All right. And that was the shift that took place in his life. The other thing that I found very interesting, he said, Paul, you know what? I've now got kids and I don't want my kids seeing me that way. And you can imagine how difficult it would be for him. Imagine bringing gifts home and you literally have your child giving you the cold shoulder saying, dad, I know where this has come from. OK, I know of a particular couple where right now that's what they're struggling with, where the wife says, you know, my husband, yes, is very wealthy, but I feel very uncomfortable about his wealth because I know that some of it is not clean money. So the people around you are affected. What I found interesting was he wasn't just talking about modeling something to his kids. He didn't want his kids to embrace his lifestyle and he didn't want to pass it on to the next generation. That speaks to me of legacy. Corruption will end in this country when we realize that we're actually stealing from our children and our children's children. We're actually stealing from ourselves, really. The problem on the African continent is that our worldview has tended to focus very much on the past and the present and is not futuristic. So our mindset isn't always that of legacy, that which says, I'm looking into the future. In fact, if you look at China, they think in centuries, don't they? But the sad thing is on the African continent, it's like we're on that how train, you know, and the train is going in one direction, but we're looking the other way. And so a lot of our battles seem to revolve around what happening, what's happening now and what happened in the past. I remember some years ago in the late 90s, I was involved in a stereotype reduction workshop. And what I found interesting there, it was in the Eastern Cape. And there was a particular group of people where people said, the stereotype we have with regards to you is that you guys are thieves. And these guys said, no, we're not thieves. We believe we're just taking back that which is already ours. And they called it affirmative shopping. And that takes me to my next point, which is the entitlement mentality. That's a massive cause when it comes to corruption. It's a massive cause of corruption. Why? Because people believe, they genuinely believe that I'm taking back that which actually belongs to me. But imagine you apply that into your own family. Just think about it. You apply that in your own family. Would you be fine with one of your kids stealing from their mother's purse because they believe that they didn't get as much pocket money as their brother or their sister. No, you would have a problem with that. So regardless of where you've come from, if your mindset is, this is my way of rewarding myself because I was involved in the struggle for this particular nation, for its liberation and so on. It's not up to you as an individual to determine how you're going to benefit from that or how you're going to reward yourself from that. Let people reward you as opposed to you going and individually believing that I can steal this and I can steal that. And my question is, when does it stop? At what point have you rewarded yourself enough? We've seen a lot of nations going bankrupt right now as we speak because that's the mentality people have had. So the issue is not really corruption, is it? It's our moral bankruptcy. Okay, we have become bankrupt morally. If I feel that I can just take from you because I'm rewarding myself, then that's a mentality of moral bankruptcy. So these are some of my feelings around the issue of entitlement. And I'm going to end with this one. A lot of people in the workplace today have become bitter. And if you look at a lot of the cases of fraud, they stem from people who believe that they were bypassed in a promotion, for a promotion. Uh, it's people who believe that the company isn't paying them enough. The resentment becomes bitterness and bitterness defiles them. And with some people, that was the first thing they ever did with regards to stealing from someone else. But it's because of the bitterness that has developed with regards to that particular organization. I believe if we start addressing some of these issues, we can get closer to healing our nation, especially when it comes to corruption. Thank you.